Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on how government can build a resilient public sector supply chain. I'm Siobhan Benita, I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar on behalf of Global Government Forum, a publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world, and our knowledge partner today, Dunn and Bradstreet. Now, in terms of today's topic, we're going to be looking at the management of public sector supply chains, looking at how government organisations can address supply chain risks and minimise threats to delivery. The global and political economic factors, be that from COVID or the situation in Ukraine, are obviously making this particularly challenging. But in addition to that, departments are also looking to increase the sustainability and resilience of their supply chains, including as they strive to meet their net zero climate targets. So all this means that it's vital that public sector organisations have a really deep understanding of where the risks lie in their supply chains, of the impact of their supply chains on the environment and the economy, and that they work effectively with their suppliers to manage these vulnerabilities. We have got a stellar panel with us here today, and in a moment I'm going to be introducing our experts who will give us some opening remarks. But really this webinar is all about you, our audience, and there'll be an opportunity after our speakers have given their opening remarks for you to put your questions to our panel. So on whichever device you are using, you should see somewhere on your device a Q&A button, a Q&A function. From any time now on onwards, please message in your questions using that Q&A function and we will get through as many of those as we can by the end of the webinar today. But let me introduce our panel then today. So first we will hear from Tommaso Aquilante, who is Associate Director of Economic Research at Dun and Bradstreet, where he's responsible for macroeconomic research and business intelligence and analytics for a large set of European economies. He's previously worked at the European Central Bank, at the University of Birmingham, and also was a senior economist at the Bank of England. Then we will hear from Chris Hansen, who is head of analysis, risk and delivery, market sourcing and suppliers at the Cabinet Office. Chris supports departments and colleagues across the public sector in the UK on their supplier resilience work, including supporting the implementation by contracting authorities of the resolution planning and economic and financial standing policies from the sourcing playbook. Before joining the government commercial organization in 2017, he worked in the energy and the aerospace industries. Then we'll hear from Barry Hooper, who is chief commercial officer at the Ministry of Justice. Barry joined the civil service in 2015, having worked in the commercial arena for more than 30 years. As the Chief Commercial Officer for the Ministry of Justice, he leads one of the largest outsourced departments within Whitehall, managing a contracted spend which exceeds 26 billion across some 4,500 contracts. Barry also oversees the operation of the department's National Distribution Center, Fleet and Engineering Services, providing critical services to support the operation of the Prison and Probation Service. Then we'll hear from Ben Masterton, who is Head of Companies and Commercial Projects at the Department of Health and Social Care. With extensive experience in the public sector, Ben has held a variety of accounting and financial management roles in the NHS and the DHCSC. He's also a non-executive shareholder representative director at the NHS Shared Business Services Limited, Community Health Partnerships Limited and NHS Property Services Limited. And last, but by no means least, we'll hear from Matthew Rees, who is Commercial Hub Director at the National Audit Office. Matthew returned to the National Audit Office in 2021 as Director of the NAO's Commercial Hub, having previously served as the NAO's Director of Corporate Finance until 2016. In the intervening period, he was the Director of Regulation and Economics at the SSRO, which is a Ministry of Defence Agency. Matthew has a wide range of private and public sector experience in accounting, corporate finance, competition policy, and economic regulation. So I'm sure you'll agree, we really do have a quality uh, panel with us here today. Please take this opportunity. I know we've got a very senior, experienced audience with us here today. Please take this opportunity to message in your questions and make the most of the time that we have with us here today. But without further ado, I'm gonna to invite Tommaso 
to give us his opening comments. Over to you, Tommaso. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure for me uh, to be here in this distinguished panel, and I hope we're going to have a very lively discussion. So <clears throat> today, I'm going to um, briefly set the, the scene and talk about uh, the macroeconomic environment and what this means for uh, supply chains in general and for uh, government supply chains uh, more um, uh, specifically. And I guess we can move to the next slide already. Um, so um, in terms of, um, you know, what are the risks that are now looming really on the macroeconomic environment. Um, we, we, have, we have identified that Dun & Bradstreet for Q3, um, you know, uh, 10 risks. We do that every quarter, actually. Every quarter, there's a publication that we put out there that anybody can, um, can access. Uh, and the link is actually on the slides that I believe will be circulated after the event. And every quarter, we try to uh, keep our clients and businesses ahead of the curve, including our uh, clients in the, in the public sector. Um, and clearly, um, inflation, or I should say stagflation, uh, tops this list. Right? Uh, we have seen uh, everywhere uh, inflation uh, rising uh, in any sector in, in the UK, actually, although in some sectors more than in others. And uh, this, is a, this is a wide phenomenon. I mean, it's something that is happening in Europe. Uh, it's happening in the US. But, you know, you know in, especially in Europe, it's, uh, it's, um, it's impacting businesses more uh, than anywhere else because some of, this, uh, some of, the, of the European countries were particularly exposed to uh, trade and energy imports um, with Russia, right? So Russia is our, you know, the, or I should say the escalation, the possible escalation uh, of the Russian-Ukraine conflict is our second uh, risk for, uh, for Q3. Here, the idea is, uh, is that um, uh, Putin will try to use even more his leverage vis-a-vis uh, -vis some European countries, and that all the measures, uh, like the contingent measures and also the structural measures to diversify supply uh, that uh, some European countries uh, have put in place, and I'm thinking of Germany uh, or Italy here or other countries in the European Union especially, will not be enough. Uh, to have a, uh, a safe winter in a sense. So, uh, you know, the stock that they are putting, uh, uh, that they are piling up at the moment might actually not be enough uh, for the winter. I'm happy to go more into details if people, um, you know, have questions on that one. And the third one is, well, uh, I'm calling it the US-China competition, but really this is the Taiwan issue, right? Uh, we have seen uh, we have seen an escalation there, and uh, despite like how remote the uh, you know the the controversy over Taiwan between the U.S. and China might seem uh, when you are sitting in Europe, this actually has a, a lot of implications for at least two reasons. Taiwan is a hub for uh, a lot of inputs that European firms uh, use, so a disruption to Taiwan, or I should say, to the microchips in Taiwan, really. Um, uh, will have um, heavy uh, consequences, big consequences all over the world, and especially in Europe and in the manufacturing sectors in Europe. And the second one is that there are signs of technological and trade uh, decoupling between the US and China, uh, which means that you know, supply chains and supply chains are changing. Uh, you know the you know the the geography of supply chains might be changing, and this might mean more costs for businesses and governments as well. Um, Raquel, can we move to the next block, please? So, what does this mean in practice, right? All of that. Uh, it means a lot of things, really. But uh, I, I would say I would focus on uh, three. Inflation is uh, is high, but what, what does it mean for uh, uh, businesses? Well, the first is that most likely uh, both, both inputs and outputs uh, and, and outputs costs uh, will uh, will increase or will have increased. This, you know, no, no matter what is the sector you are sitting in. Um, and of course, supply chains are essentially the engine on which uh, price rises really uh, run. This means that you, the inventories of businesses will be impacted, stocks will be depreciated. And this is obviously a strict 
you know, a, a like a discussion that is very much related to, uh, you know, the model of supply chains that we were used to, the, you know, so-called uh, just in time, which somebody uh, has now relabeled just in case. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we can we can get to this um, as well. But, you know, certainly there is um, there is only a limited amount of things that firms uh, or businesses and again, governments will be able to do, at least in the short run, I'll get to this a little bit later. Um, in terms of higher rates, uh, you know, central banks are possibly, I think it's fair to say, uh, behind the curve, some more than others, uh, when reacting to uh, increasing prices. They are doing it now, but since, uh, uh, you know, they, they are doing it only now or only recently, uh, they might have to put the brakes on much more strongly than they would have otherwise done if uh, they, they had it. Um, you know, previously. So uh, this is an issue, obviously, for businesses, because businesses will see their cost of capital increase. Um, now, what is the impact uh, that higher rates can have? Uh, it depends really on whether you are the buyer or the seller of the relationship. And, and also, what is your, you know, the term structure, really, of your contract, whether uh, how much for how much time you are locked in in a contract. And, you know, this is not very different from what happens to, uh, well, households now with mortgaging, right, or, uh, or having uh, a fixed rate for five years. It's, it's pretty, pretty similar. I think the analogy there is important. Now, coming to like one variable that I believe can, uh, you know, be seen as a summary statistic of all the things that we, we are talking about here is the, the FX risk, right? So most of you will have noticed that the pound has depreciated vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. By the way, the euro has depreciated even more vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis the dollar. Um, uh, and, you know, and this, if you had anticipated this uh, in time, uh, or, or in other words, if you had any hedging um, strategy in place, you might be now uh, maybe suffering uh, comparatively less with respect to your competitors. But that's not an easy thing to do, right? The exchange rate is notoriously difficult to, to predict. So I guess uh, the, the, the easiest thing I can, or the only really thing that I can uh, suggest here when it comes to currency diversity, when it comes to currency risk is currency diversification when possible, because it's not always possible. I mean, like uh, sometimes uh, the currency of, of an invoice is dictated by the, the, the part of the contract that has the highest bargaining power, right? So you don't pick your, your currency, someone else is picking the currency for you. But to the extent that this is possible, firms should do this. Uh, and the other thing they should do is obviously you know, the good old uh, supply chain diversification, which uh, it's important to stress, it goes in all directions. It goes downstream and, and upstream. Um, you know, um, there is a, there's a famous picture uh, from a Poland Trust professor of international trade at, at the Harvard Business School, at the Harvard School of Economics, where he showed for the first time now, I think back in 2013, uh, 2012 rather, then uh, that, uh, you know, um, uh, the iPad or the iPhone are, uh, is made of 50, uh, uh, is made of a myriad of components, uh, which come from uh, 53 different countries uh, in the world, okay? Um, and so like, and then Apple puts all of that uh, together. So uh, like, you know, you really have to look at it you have to have a network view rather than just an upstream view or a downstream view. Now, all of that, you know, since I don't, I didn't want to uh, like to only talk about bad things. So maybe the third block uh, will give us some uh, partly good news. So if we look at, um, if you look at what is happening, uh, you know, in terms of a uh, depression on supply chains, I, I would say we have some somewhat a good news here, right? Supply chain is easy globally. Uh, supply chain pressure, I mean, is easy globally. Um, and, and that's good news because it will help uh, certainly policymakers uh, in their response. Um, but it's still way, way higher than it was pre-pandemic. Okay, so we are still in a high pressure environment. It's just better than it used to be at, say, towards the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022. So uh, Raquel, can we move to the next slide, please? So 
I thought I would I would finish um, this uh, introduction with well, uh, really like a possible framework and and some trends on uh, where we are going, uh, which uh, which I hope will be of uh, interest. Uh, to me, the most important thing, uh, independently of the sector that you are sitting in, where your firm or your uh, local agency is, is, is located, visibility is the most important thing. Okay? Data, information, if you want. I mean, like, if you, don't, if you don't have the good data, the good visibility in, in your network, uh, you, know, you, 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 you cannot start with, uh, with the right foot, in a sense. Visibility is a necessary condition for agility. How, if I know more or less where where problems might arise, I might be quick. I might be quick in solving that. And the third point that I don't see much uh, mentioned around is actually trust. There is a lot of economic literature now uh, saying that um, you know if you are if you are in a good relationship with your supplier you have been in a good relationship with your supplier for a long time, uh, then this supplier is likely uh, to be a little bit more patient when, when financial distress uh, comes on you. And this, in terms of crisis, can be, you know, can be the difference between you surviving and going bankrupt. Okay? And the other one is diversification. Uh, I have already uh, talked about this. Um, I guess I have one more minute, Raquel. Uh, can I, um, can I, uh, yeah, thank you. So, I thought I would stress, uh, you know, two trends that we are uh, seeing nowadays, which I think are very important uh, for, I would should say, government departments, but also policy more generally, right? Uh, one is the transition to clear energy, and here I believe the implications for the public sector are at least twofold, right? Like the first one is that you are in a sense a policy sector. So, you know, if you are setting the policy for businesses and the others, uh, you are more credible if you are doing certain things yourself. If you are, you know, dealing, you, you, you are doing deals or operating with uh, businesses that essentially respect the policy that you that you are imposing, uh, that's, that's absolutely uh, important. So the other one is on the operational side of things. I mean, like, um, I think it's fair to say that tr transition comes with um, with a cost, right, attached to it, with benefits, uh, but also with a cost, which I don't see much uh, mentioned around. But I think it's important to mention um, a cost in terms of compliance, uh, for example, or a cost in terms of uh, you know. Uh, what are the differences across markets when it comes to ESG, for example? There is good news on that. Uh, you know, at Dun & Bradstreet, we have a wealth of data we can give you on, uh, on uh, whether if, if you want to rank uh, businesses uh, in terms of ESG. And the other one, which is very close to my heart, is what's going to happen to globalization. Okay? The world we have lived in in the last 20 years is a world of open markets. It's a world of very low costs, especially uh, labor costs and commodity costs. Um, is all of that going to change? Uh, partly, I think, uh, you know, we will see partly a, a reversion from that. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, and the question really is what, it, what, what this means um, for businesses. And um, I, I would say that the main implication here is that, you know, businesses will, will have to understand uh, you know, uh, we, we will have to take an holistic view of the risks that are in their supply chains. Okay, it's uh, um, it's obviously related to costs. It's obviously related to prices, uh, but not only. Uh, more and more, I see uh, geopolitical uh, the geopolitical dimension of risk as uh, one that it, that is going to be very important. I mean, I mentioned China, US, but it's not the only one. Um, and I will stop here probably. Thanks, Tomaso. Thank you so much, Tomasa. I mean, what a great way to kick off, because I think you've really set the scene with those big global macroeconomic kind of issues. So the three things you mentioned there is your top three risks, uh, inflation, Russia, Ukraine, and then the US-China kind of relationship. Talking about the changing geography of supply chains, the changing nature there leading to kind of uh, cost rising, uh, implications and impact on stocks and levels of stocks, and then impact on currency exchanges as well and and how difficult it is i think to be able to mitigate some of those risks so limited kind of things that people can do but then moving on to maybe some of the things that actually can help so the importance of data you stressed there the importance of understanding where those risks might be so that you can take some 
preventative uh, measures and then really looking to the future as well on are your suppliers in line with your kind of greener objectives and then that big picture how is kind of everything going to change if globalization itself is changing and fluxing so thank you so much for that setting the scene on the big picture we're now going to move down to the kind of UK focus and move down to uh, hear from our departmental uh, kind of representatives so Chris I'm coming over to you to give us some opening thoughts from the cabinet office Thank you, and thanks to Vasa. That was really interesting. So, I think the from what Tomaso said, the things that are particularly uh, impactful uh, in the, the areas that I think about uh, around the the cost of borrowing and lender appetite for the the particular sectors that our suppliers come from and the individual suppliers. That's going to be critical in the the medium to long term. Um, and I really I'm really pleased he pulled out trust because. What we find is when there's a really good relationship between the, the contracting authority, the customer and the supplier, um, you, you can manage through financial distress, you can manage through difficult contracts. Um, it's where there's the, you know, the, the trust is under pressure that things get you know, really difficult. So, um, so I work in the market sourcing and suppliers team in central um, commercial in cabinet office. Um, my role is mainly covering risk particularly looking at supplier resilience and resilience of supply chains and what we can do when we're worried about that and sort of various mitigations. Um, and I'd like to give a sort of big plug because the to the, the sourcing playbook and its associated more specialist um, publications, because that is a really useful tool to help you guys as, as buyers, as procurement and commercial professionals um, across governments, help, help you manage these risks. There's loads of guidance in there. And I'm going to talk about two particular key policies that I've got a strong involvement with, which is the economic and financial standing and resolution planning. Um, the, the team I work in, market sourcing and suppliers, we're there to actually help you guys um, implement them, understand them, provide guidance. And we've got some really good people in our team that can, can reach out and provide a lot of support. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just reflecting on that support that's available, um, there's a lot of information available on online within the various commercial um, and government training um, systems, platforms. And if you contact sourcing.program at cabinetoffice.gov.uk or get in touch with me, um, I can put you in touch with people who can really help you understand these policies and, and how to implement them effectively. Can we go to the next slide, please? But I just want to talk a little bit more about the two that I have the most involvement with because they're the most relevant to this particular uh, session. So economic and financial standing, what is that? That is financial due diligence on your prospective supplier or your existing supplier. So that the purpose of it is to assess the, the bidder's financial capacity to perform the contract and then work out if there's any appropriate risk mitigation that you need to implement because you've detected a problem or you know, that there's, there's a mismatch with the supplier's financial capacity and actually the risk associated with your contract. A lot of this comes down to knowing your contract, knowing your service. What is it that you're procuring? What is it that you're managing? And understanding how critical a contract that is, what it means for your organization, what risk is inherent in there? Is it a really complicated, really critical contract or are you buying paper clips? And so we, we have various systems, you know, we've got a contract tiering tool that will help you decide if it's a gold, silver or bronze, but it's knowing fundamentally knowing your contract. You also then want to consider as part of the EFS policy, which financial metrics do you actually, actually matter for you, um, for your uh, prospective supplier? And that would depend on the, the sector that your supplier is in, the nature of the service and the contract duration. So a construction contract might be quite different from an IT contract. And you've got to pick the right financial metrics. And then looking at the mitigations, we'll be looking at um, the, the requirements you might place on the supplier. So provision of a parent company guarantee, for example, or a performance bond. Um, my position is that every critical contract across the public sector should have a contingency plan or an exit plan or a service continuity plan. You should know what you would do if things went wrong and it should be implementable and you know, work in the event of a supplier insolvency. 
Another example of a mitigation might be project bank, bank accounts, quite common in the construction sector, and step-in rights, so that you can actually take control of the, the service, the contract yourself, maybe to then re-procure um, and pass it on to another supplier very quickly. But you've got a lot more control if you've got that, uh, that step-in right. And the other part of EFS is ongoing monitoring. If you've got a five-year contract, how frequently should you be monitoring your, your incumbent supplier to make sure that you don't get any nasty surprises? Can we go to the next slide, please? So the other policy that I'm very heavily involved in is resolution planning. So this is, even if you've done everything right and you've got a financially robust supplier, things happen. So this is all about contingency planning and making sure that uh, your service is kept as safe as can be if something goes wrong. It's contingency planning effectively. It's done at the supplier level, not the contract level. And that the goal is to get sufficient information about a supplier to form the basis of a contingency plan if things, if there's a financial distress event or something, uh, something happens. Explicitly, it's not an assessment of the supplier's financial viability. That's done through procurement. That's done through the economic and financial standing. This is more just information about if something happened, how it might go. And, and as part of that, it's not a procurement requirement. It's a post-contractual requirement, which is an important distinction. These things are quite... Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of work to do this. You don't want suppliers doing this unless they've actually won a contract. And you only need one per supplier because it's at the supplier level. If you hold a critical service or a critical contract, then ideally you should have a resolution plan. And that's what the, the policy says. And if the supplier is actually public sector dependent, so it relies on more than 50% of its revenues coming from the public sector, then again, a resolution plan is appropriate. And just to break down the mystery a little bit, the a resolution plan is made up of three components. It's exposure, it's what critical contracts across the public sector does that supplier have? So we know we know what would happen if the supplier became insolvent, what would be what would be affected. It's about resolvability. So how complicated is that supplier? Um, what's the corporate structure? What is the operational interconnectedness? Where do they deliver? What organization do they deliver the service from? and how, how do the finances connect to that. So effectively, if the top go becomes insolvent, what happens to the rest of the business and what would happen to your service? And then lastly, there's the latest financial position because that actually influences some of the resolvability. So for example, if the pension scheme status, if there's suddenly a huge deficit, that will have an impact on the resolvability of that supplier. And so those three elements together give you a really good picture of um, the resolvability of the, the company and what you can do in a crisis. I'll stop there. Um, Thanks, that's so the... Thanks, Chris. That really brings it down, I think, to kind of the level that a lot of our audience, I think, will be considering at the moment. So I like that, that you picked up on what Tomasa had said about the importance of trust and building those relationships with suppliers. I think that sits alongside the data uh, as kind of ways to know if something is uh, potentially coming down the road as well. Um, the key message there for people watching as well is that you're there to help and support across government departments and organisations. Um, what you said there, obviously drilling down into those two areas of how to conduct financial due diligence, but also then the importance of contingency planning and the importance of monitoring going forward as well. So lots, I think, for people to think about there and unpick. And we will share all of these slides, but obviously people can get in touch with you afterwards, Chris, I assume, if you want to continue with any of these conversations. And um, we're already getting some questions in. There's a kind of million dollar question come in that I'm gonna to give to everybody uh, when we come to the questions. But before that, Barry, I'm coming over to you from an MOJ perspective. Yeah, thanks, Siobhan. Um, just to build on a couple of points, I mean, Tommaso there has, has picked on some of the big macro issues. But in my 30 odd year career in commercial, I have to say the, the concentration effect of the issues that we're dealing with currently um, is probably unprecedented. So if we look at what that means for the UK, um, you know, we've had issues in terms of driver shortages, we've got issues around fuel, we've got supply and demand issues, we've got issues around cost of living and what that means for national living wage, minimum wage in the UK. Um, that in turn is leading to levels of disruption and strike action in certain markets. So as a commercial professional, I would say that there is a real focus at the moment in terms of how we as commercial people start to A, understand that risk, 
and how we inform both the governance within our own organisations and how we help set those that sit on our boards and the audit and risk committees. What is our risk appetite? Because everything I'm seeing at the moment is a real channeling of, of concentration of effort into the commercial space, which needs to a great extent to be supported with additional funding, resource and support, whether that's through proactive supply monitoring, supply chain due diligence. I mean, if you look at some of the issues that we've seen in the automotive sector and availability. Um, it's just frozen for a second, but I think he'll come back in. He's got a slight problem with his uh, connection, but he will come back in in a second if he does. Hopefully I'm back in. Yeah, you're back <laughs> in. Thanks. Um, within the automotive sector, we've seen issues with chip supply, and that probably is three or four levels below the supply chain. Um, but in other areas, we've seen instances where six or seven layers below the supply chain, we've started to see issues that have, have bitten. So to what extent are we required to do that level of supply chain mapping and due diligence? And to that extent, where do we pass that responsibility to the supply chain? And how does that then materialise in terms of cost of services that are then provided? But to Chris's point around things like the construction playbook, we've, we are one of the beneficiaries of that in terms of the cross-government work. And in the construction sector in particular, we've done quite a bit of work, for example, on looking at supply chain resiliency, but also in terms of um, pointing to one of the questions there in the chat, looking to embed social value within those contracts. So things like looking at low carbon concrete, for example, on the application of design for manufactured assembly, the proximity of concrete plants to where we're building and working with our supply chain to implement that. There are loads of things that we can do within the supply chain, but how we build that agenda, what we focus on and how we focus on that will be particular to each organisation, to the sector that we're operating in. And I think looking more recently to and probably some of the points that um, we'll pick up in Department of Health later, but things like, for example, COVID-19. I mean, who would have imagined that overnight commodity based items that we've purchased would suddenly turn into a something that was subject to free market economics and supply and demand issues, uh, which would then even lead into you know, trade negotiations between countries or border control issues. Um, you know, these things are coming thick and fast and the requirement for us to understand and pivot is really important. And I think to that point where my other hat as chairman of the Board of World Commerce and Contracting, one of the things I have noticed more globally is this constant push towards relational contracting. So again, to Chris's and Tommaso's point earlier, really looking at how you leverage the relationships and how you build the relationships so that in times of crisis, you can come together. Uh, but again, that's an interesting dynamic when the wider political agenda is at play, trade negotiations are at play, uh, and what that means for your respective organisation. And again, it sort of adds a different flavour and dynamic to what we as commercial professionals now have to manage in terms of this multidimensional, volatile, uncertain world that we operate in. Thanks, Barry. That's great. I mean, I think lots of things there. Um, but I think the audience, and I definitely want to pick up on in the uh, conversation afterwards, that concentration effect you're saying unprecedented. So I think it'd be interesting to know, in addition to the global issues, what's going on in the UK as well, specifically to lead to this kind of unprecedented kind of challenges that people are facing. Um, also interesting what you said there about who's responsible for that wider mapping of the supply chain, uh, you know, the different levels down. Uh, being affected and then again coming back to this importance of relationships in the supply chain um, and that might raise questions I think as well about different types of skills that maybe are needed in the profession if the kind of nature of this is changing yeah. as well so that might be an issue we can come back to as well. Thanks so much Barry. Ben I'm coming over to you. Uh, great, thanks. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Masterson, uh, an accountant by trade and uh, someone who's, having been an accountant for a while, worked in commercial for, for 20 years. Um, having, having heard all that really interesting strategic stuff, um, which was, you know, frankly, far more interesting than most of my day job, I thought it'd be useful to largely back colleagues up, especially um, Chris, who was talking about the, um, the, um, the government commercial playbook with a bit of an anecdote. So being an accountant, I largely get called in when there are problems uh, in this area, um, not, not at the procurement stage, but somewhat later on. 
But I think if I take you all through a little anecdote, first of all, um, I put in, I've put a table of figures in here, uh, and this goes back to this issue of, of due diligence and, and why all the other things around maintaining a, uh, a you know, a, a robust supply chain are so important or a robust um, sourcing strategy is so important. This is a real example. I've, re I, I've anonymized it with a silly name, but this is a real example of an organization that's causing us some difficulty in the DHSC at the moment. Uh, and I wanted to highlight some issues around due diligence. So I, I've, I've put ratios together, which are ratios that people usually look at. So the first one's profit and being profitable or not profitable, is an indication really of where your business is going over the longer term. It doesn't tell you about how you can meet your bills in the short term and whether you're about to go off a cliff, um, but it tells you where your business is headed. And then I've also looked at the standard from sort of 30 years ago when I was doing training and all that sort of thing, the standard liquidity ratio, which is um, current assets as in cash and receivables and so on divided by your liabilities now this particular organization um looked great on the basis of its 2017 accounts i can't tell you what this organization is but if you if if you went on companies a house website and pulled the accounts you would see that those two that march 2017 accounts were actually submitted in march 2018 and so on all the way along the row. So if in March or February 2018, you were thinking of letting a contract, as in, and that's only what, four and a half years ago, you were thinking of letting a five year contract, um, you'd have seen some pretty good figures really, you wouldn't have worried about anything at all. If you'd been letting a contract in February 2019, well, you'd have a 2% profit, you know, the business is still profitable. Um, you might be worried about the fact that it had gone down a bit from the previous year, but it's still profitable. And you've got a just about satisfactory liquidity ratio. But this organization really is in trouble. And if we can, I can't tell, but have we got the final column, the 21 one, which shows accounts not submitted? Well, this is the position we're in. And I must say, I'm not fully up to speed with uh, what the Companies Act uh, penalties are for non-timely non submission of accounts uh, for ordinary limited companies, but I think they're pretty feeble. And this organization hasn't submitted yet. So we're completely in the dark. So I just wanted to put the due diligence part in, um, in, uh, you know, in context really people could have done a great job in due diligence uh, on this company and still found themselves having to deal with a very difficult situation. This company isn't yet insolvent, but it's, it's, it's causing us some difficulties. So at this point, I come back to a lot of what's been said previously, but I just wanted to bring some things out. Again, if we're gonna let financial due diligence drive everything, that sort of suggests that we might rule some suppliers out of what we're gonna do. Well, if we rule suppliers out, we get less competition. We also, you know, some of these people with weaker balance sheets and so on and, and, and less or no trading history might be the innov innovative players. So bear that in mind, you might not get the innovation. And then ultimately the good, you know, the, the good financial performance of people may come from the fact that they're, you know, for a whole host of reasons, their prices are partly because they're, they're, they're pricing higher. So, you know, we need to be careful about setting a high uh, solvency bar. And this, uh, and this then comes back to, again, a question that's been sort of roughly mooted earlier on, what's our appetite for risk? There are some types of contract where you would have a very low uh, appetite for risk, I expect many people on the call can recall the pictures uh, on the news of Royal Liverpool Hospital after the contractor Carillion went bust and the water coming through the ceiling and everything else. 
Uh, stepping rights were mentioned previously. Uh, the, the, the hospital in question, uh, Royal Liverpool Hospital NHS Trust certainly had stepping rights, but would you want to step into that? Mm. So that's an example of a contract where I would suggest, uh, again, it's very, 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 very difficult. This due diligence and, and doing it a long way out is very, very difficult. Um, but that's an area where I would suggest construction, you know, major construction projects is an area where I would suggest you would have a low, uh, uh, low appetite for risk. As I understand it, the cost of stepping in at Royal Liverpool and finishing it was near enough as much as the project had cost in the first place, although I'm not close to it. So that's an area where you would have a, a low uh, appetite for risk. Um, uh, and again, prob probably I don't need to say very much more here because um, I think Chris mentioned uh, contingency planning and in particular keeping these live. Uh, the, the key issue is if, you, if an insolvency is going to hit you, you want to be on the front foot. You want to be able to move quickly. You want to be able to move quickly to another, another means of achieving um, service continuity and so on. So, 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 so that stuff's really, really important and, he, and is kind of backed up by the, the you know, but by, by dealing with the collapses that uh, I've had to help deal with recently. The other thing again is, and um, there were some great comments made about um, trust uh, earlier on, and, and I wouldn't uh, go against any of them. Uh, a, a trusting uh, supplier customer relationship is, is the best thing to have. But again, going back to the issue of very old accounts and that kind of thing, monitoring every single KPI in your contract is something I would strongly recommend because delay in maintenance and things like that might well be giving you a warning uh, long ahead of the account. And then of course, the other thing is, if someone's say delaying maintenance in, in an FM contract or, or, or some sort of contract, if they do go over, that's work that should have been done that hasn't been done. And frankly, you're gonna to have to pick up the tab for. So those are, those are probably just the, the points I'd really wanted to um, emphasize here is financial due diligence is very limited. Yeah. Um, I could come up with lots of examples like this. In fact, nearly every example, you know, nearly every, if you, if you work back through every insolvency, you would probably see a picture pretty similar to this. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to emphasize the contingency planning and the constant KPI monitoring because you just can't rule out an insolvency. Thanks, Ben. So really good summary there. Limitations of that financial due diligence, but the importance, as you say, of contingency planning and monitoring and I think when we uh, when we come to the conversation I want to ask Tommaso there if he thinks his focus on data could help with some of that monitoring and early warning but also maybe something what you said about um, looking at suppliers in a different way some of them might be innovators mm -hmm. you don't want to rule them out just because on the accounts they might not look uh, like the suppliers you want so lots of issues there to unpick thank you so much Ben uh, please do keep your questions coming in because this is our final uh, present uh, presentation now Matthew over to you yes great thanks Good afternoon everybody um if we could just go to the second slide I'll, I'll just outline a little bit about what I wanted to talk about so the diagram on the right is really just trying to illustrate that I'll go mostly into the financial side and then and then I'll look at some of the sustainability themes but I've grouped it around the first two points from our own work, which as, as most colleagues from government will know, we've got a pretty much a running commentary on, on, on these things. Um, then I'll just briefly mention a little bit about how government is pointing um, its own supply chain towards sustainability, uh, highlight some of the work we've been doing there, and then finish off by highlighting four pieces of guidance, which we've published to, to really try to help solve some of these challenges. Um, I think our sense with our insights work is that proactive, positive, forward-looking stuff is, is really what, what we can do much more of. So, so there's four examples there. So if we, if we go on to the onto the next slide, please. Um, I, mean, I think the anecdote really here is, you know, when people say, well, how did it go wrong? It's slowly at first and then all of a sudden. Um, and, and, you know, when you look across the work that we've done, 
there's no shortage of examples of us looking at the causes of failure. Um, I'm not going to read out all the different reports, but just a few examples there. So, you know, the, the role of data, the role of contract management, the role of kind of supply monitoring, the role of resilience, all of those things are, are really good, good practice. Uh, you know, we've come along and we, we've seen that. And, you know, it, it's, I think it's, it's unavoidable that we'll see that in the future. Um, so, yeah, if you, you can obviously look into those NAA reports because they, they take you much more into detail. So if we go into the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I guess then, then the question is, well, what, what do we see from the commercial teams in terms of monitoring? And, and you know, obviously we've, we've seen and heard today a lot about the good practice. Unfortunately, we've seen, you know, a number of places where this isn't happening at all. So we'd obviously hope that people listening today and following the guidance will take heed of all the really good guidance that we've heard today. Um, and obviously, for, for, from our point of view, we've probably gone a little bit further than just the pure supply chain piece. So, so we've looked recently at the energy supplier market, you know, consumer facing services. These are where government has to step in to, to sustain um, supply. Um, government is sitting there as, as a supplier of last resort. Um, some of the regulators, for example, Ofgem, have, have tried to shift those failed suppliers to other suppliers. But of course, when you look at bulb energy, we've had government actually having to get involved in special administration appointments as well. So th this issue about monitoring supply chain transcends the pure outsourced procurement model. Government's involved in it right across into the consumer and business facing market as well. Um, so I guess my, my kind of theme there is that, you know, we, we obviously we're auditing government departments. We also audit regulators um, and this set of tools and techniques is applicable in that regulated market space as well. Um, and then finally on that slide, we've also looked at local government and some, some quite significant strains on local government as a result of um, commercial activity and the balance between grant income and commercial activity is putting them under strain. So we've done quite a lot of work recently to try to uh, do, do a, a dashboard on, on local government financial sustainability. So that, that's actually a live data um, portal that you can look at. Um, so brief, briefly on the next slide is uh, going to shift the attention really to sustainability. Um, I think as people have mentioned speaking, this is a really important theme for government. Um, you know, there's a lot going on both in terms of procurement strategy and carbon reduction plans, which really mean that the, the the purchasing responsibility is now looking not just at financial sustainability, but the broader net zero objectives of government. Um, and of course, if, if I go on to the next page, um, we've, we have looked at some of these areas. I think where, where I sort of candidly place the NAO at the moment is we're, we're still trying to put a kind of clear structure around this. At the moment, we've dipped into quite a few different areas. So, you know, we, we, we've looked at the electric vehicle market, that's obviously going much further than just how does government shift its own vehicle fleet to electric, but what is it policy for, for consumers? We looked across the defence sector, it's one of the largest emitters, um, particularly its own estate. But one of the major issues with a lot of that, that um, data for, from government is that it doesn't include the supply chain at the moment. So that, that scope three emissions data is pretty scarce from, from government. Um, so so we, we, we've got an eye on that. Um, and then, as I said, we talk, talk um, briefly about our, our knowledge products. So I'll just quickly skim through the next few slides. So um, improving government data. Um, yes, we think that does need to improve. So there's a, there's a really useful guide there that you can download and have a look at. Uh, if I go to the next slide, um, climate change risk, um, a sort of high level guide there for audit and risk committees, um, but it certainly looks at how risk monitoring is improving in government, what else we think needs to happen. So that, that's a, a real you know, agenda for most, uh, most departments and organisations now. Hopefully this, this guide will, will help. I think you can see the data on the survey. The survey really indicated that this is not being given quite the level of attention that it needed to. So hopefully that, that's being improved. Um, and then just briefly on the last couple, um, last year, the, the commercial team that I lead, we put out a guide that a lot of it mirrors the um, playbooks, but it's our own take on it built around our own uh, experience. 
And then finally, for me, the, the final slide is, is a piece really on corporate finance. So that was actually published yesterday. Um, and then there's loads of really useful questions and challenge um, themes there that we've picked out from uh, really across across a wide body of, of audits. And so hopefully with those sort of four guides and other knowledge products, you'll start to see that we're, we're being a bit more proactive and helping people to, to address these issues before they become real uh, insurmountable problems. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. So again, you reiterated some of the things that can help, you know, good use of data to get insights, building those relationships, good monitoring, but actually despite all of that, you're still gonna get failures, lots of those causes of failures that you listed there. Interesting, I wanna come back to this in a minute, but not everybody is following the guidance. Like really there's a whole range, a whole spectrum there of what people are doing. So we could maybe think about why is that the case? And then again, looking to the future, not just about financial sustainability now, but people are gonna to have to start really focusing in on the environmental sustainability as well of their supply chains. And again, that's gonna be a new, uh, a new thing to test officials uh, how they actually do that. And again, we will share all of those links and everything, your slides with everybody watching so they can access your guidance as well as the guidance that Chris mentioned. Barry, I know you wanted to come in before we move on to questions from the audience. I think you wanted to pick up on something that Matthew had said there. Yeah, I mean, first of all, just to say, I mean, I think the knowledge products that the NAO have produced are fantastic pieces of work that really challenge uh, the way that we operate and the way that we currently deliver. Hopefully, Barry will be back. Well, that was enough, just the praise. Greatly <laughs> received. Thank you. It stopped on where you said how wonderful uh, that Matthew's. There, there was a but coming. <laughs> now they are great pieces of work and what I'd also point to is some of the research work from the Institute for Government actually, uh, which again can be a great source of knowledge. But the point that I wanted to pick up on Matthew is your piece around markets. And I think what we need to recognise is that we as governments not only create markets, we regulate them sometimes and we're also responsible for the stewardship of them. Uh, and certainly when we work with Chris and the suppliers and markets team, we are seeing that the number of strategic suppliers to government is growing. And I think we need to look at that more dynamically in terms of how we as government interact with those providers, the bigger ones in particular, in terms of stewarding them to make sure they've got the capacity to bid and that we're not all competing for the same business development teams and resource and support. Uh, and that's one area where I do think that government has been much more proactive in coming together to try and create that. And I think the, um, the groups and the market engagement groups that Chris's team and through Claire Gibbs have set up is a way of doing that. But I think we do need to be more cognizant of the fact that, you know, we do need to be not only managing suppliers, but managing the markets within which we operate. Yeah, no, th thanks, Barry. It, it certainly wasn't a set up question, but we've just put on our website a note that we're going to start to look at um, the competition theme within procurement. And I think you're absolutely right. It's that whole supply side market depth mm -hmm. question that, um, you know, that, that, that we can highlight on and certainly happy to follow up and in due course discuss in these kinds of forums all but what we find. Thanks Matthew. I've got two very quick questions that may even go to the audience question but James Smith has said more of a comment than a question what a fascinating session so many thanks for having such incredibly talented speakers so there that's a positive feedback to you all already but um, two things I wanted to say one to Chris picking up on Matthew's point there's all this guidance it seems like you've got great guidance available uh, what's the barriers? Why are some people not accessing that guidance? Why in some of those NAO reports are they saying people not doing some of this uh, due diligence work? Is it is it people aren't aware that that guidance is there? It, it might be. Uh, that's why I'm trying to, to flag it up. Um, it's quite easy to find, but like most things that we produce as government, the, you know, the, there's different levels of depth to it and sometimes yeah. it can be a bit hard going without someone helping you along and sort of talking you through it and that sort of thing so, so that's what some of our team do you know we, we help people get into it and understand practically how to deliver it yeah, um, yeah I, I think also there's you know we're talking quite a lot about financially type stuff yeah um, my experience is you get people who embrace financial stuff and people who run run for to the hills um, yeah. run from it yeah. and getting the right people involved you know the commercial functions got fantastically talented people they're not all financial experts we yeah. need to sort of borrow the resources of our, our finance colleagues and and they're stretched with their own jobs so sort of having some um sensitive use of, of finance colleagues expertise 
in a sort of well well telegraphed yeah. way um, is, is really key actually to, to making good decisions. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So again, that collaboration across the profession is really important. Tommaso, I want to ask you this. I want to pick up on what Ben said about um, kind of all those mitigation um, activities having limited kind of impact. You know, there's only so much you can do. But then Ben also stressed the importance of kind of making sure you don't cut out the you know suppliers that could potentially be really good, but also the importance of monitoring. Everybody's mentioned data and how data can be more useful. Can data then help Ben in some of those issues? So I would say, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. So I would say data is not the answer, but it's a, an important part of the answer, okay? So I don't envisage a world in which data is gonna take decisions instead of the decision makers. Okay, because otherwise we can put machines there instead of managers, they do the job, we program them. That's not the world we, we live in. But, you know, it, it can absolutely um, help. Um, you know, Dun & Bradstreet, for example, provides a lot of uh, supply chain analytics that you, you can get in touch with. And, you know, we pride ourselves for having like products that allow you to look way beyond the first layers of your supply chain, for example. Um, when it comes to monitoring, let me stress that I didn't mean that, uh, you know, now trust is a substitute for, say, due diligence or monitoring. It's more a complement. It's mm -hmm. something that when the contingency is uh, really, really bad, if you have a history, a reputation of being a good supplier uh, in, a good, in, a, in, a, in a relationship that has lasted for a long time, there is evidence that, you know, um, some uh, financial distress for you is more tolerated by the people that have to say either extend or uh, or exact the credit mm -hmm. that you you uh, you owe them, right? Um, finally, we shouldn't cut out uh, you know uh, suppliers that could grow into being something that is um, you know uh, productive and important. I agree. The problem there is how you do it, right? I do agree that the risk there is that, you know, you are, uh, you know, some young firms, small firms that could grow into become something very, very important and big and could scale up, uh, you know, you could make a mistake uh, there. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think anyone has an answer for that. Uh, the market somehow should decide this uh, and the market also can make mistakes. But the, you know, there is something out there which is called zombie firms, which I think we should we should probably talk about in, in this context. You know, uh, zombie firms are one of the issues uh, that brings productivity down uh, in uh, many markets, including the UK. Okay, so as usual, there is no free lunch and there is a trade off there, right? On the one hand, uh, you 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 risk of you know killing somebody that could grow and become a very productive firm. On the other, if you kill some of this, yeah, maybe you kill competition, although I would say their competition is non-linear, but let's not, 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 swear, let's not be too technical there. Uh, but on the other side, you can actually increase productivity mm. by eliminating these firms that are not productive enough. Mm. But that's for the policymakers. For firms, in a, uh, so that's for people sitting in ministries and so on and so forth. I, for, for me, for firms, I mean like, there is a wealth of data tools that you can use. Look holistically at, uh, at, um, at the problem. That's what also institutions do. Look at different approaches. And I know that this requires resources for doing that. But have a look for that uh, products because sometimes they might be coming to you at a much more competitive price than you believe. Okay, you think, oh, this data analytics is gonna, yeah. is gonna cost me a fortune. Not necessarily. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tommaso. I am going to come to Robert's question because that was the first question that came in, but I want to keep on this issue of kind of data and analytics. And um, Adedeo has just said um, data might influence AI in contract management. So I guess just this whole issue around kind of data, new technologies, new ways of doing analytics. Is that something, Matthew, you mentioned data as well, and maybe data, the importance of data in looking at the kind of environmental sustainability 
of um, supply chains. Do you think this is something that civil servants are going to have to get their head around more? Is this kind of something that we're going to need to have a bit of investment in upskilling civil servants in how to do Well, that? yeah, I mean, I think so. the way that we've organised our knowledge teams is we, we, we have an analysis hub and we have a digital hub as well, because we recognise that, that understanding this is, is really important. And a lot of our work now, when we collect audit data and we do analysis, we're, we're trying to automate that because it's obviously much more efficient mm -hmm. and more informative. Um, and there's some really great practice across government as well. Um, you know, but, but these these do require investment and, you know, they're challenging. Um, I mean, in the narrow sense of our discussion today, procurement, and, you know, transparency and openness with data around, you know, commercial decisions is, is a challenge for government. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly some ambitions now with the procurement bill, um, but a number of stakeholders are raising questions about how strong that commitment is. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so, so I think time will tell, but we're, we're certainly yeah. really keen to see good quality analysis informing decisions and, and, and learning from, from, you know, prior examples. You can use data more effectively across government. And... Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Ben, I want to come back to you because obviously you pointed out the limitations of just looking at kind of financial accounts, but this whole issue around using data to drive insights differently about potential suppliers, is that something that you think is helpful? Um, well, yes, I think it in increases your your knowledge. So, for example, taking taking the single example that I gave, what what general data of the kind that Thomas was talking about, um, you know, both times he spoke, um, can sort of tell you that if you don't know it yet, you need to be looking. Mm. So you could sit there and wait for these one-year-old accounts and all the rest of it, but you could start asking the questions earlier if, for example, you, you, you realise that data on a sector is showing that there are problems in a sector. Yeah. So I, th I think the wider, uh, the wider data is a very good point for people, not just financial data, you know, other operational data. Yeah. Um, again, as I think Barry said earlier, the disruption that we've seen from, you know, to, to the supply chains he's responsible for, from, uh, from say, um, COVID, from Brexit, um, from strikes caused by the uh, cost of living crisis and so on. Um, those kind of things eventually feed through into the financial numbers. Yeah. Um, you know, so um, I, I think they're very good points on the data. And actually, again, you know, the whole kind of thrust of what I was saying is you leave yourself very exposed if you're looking at old financial data of, of, yeah. of the single organisation that you're dealing with. Thanks, Ben. Chris, Barry, before I move on, did you want to say anything about data uh, before I move on to Robert's question? I think um, in terms of, I'm very interested in data on the supply chains of the, the suppliers. I mean, Barry's point about sort of six or seven layers down the, the supply chain, there being potentially something, a, a problem there. Um, my experience has been that your tier one suppliers are not necessarily looking after their supply chains for you, not in the way you might assume. And so being really Knowing, knowing the service and knowing, let, let's say, take an IT service, knowing all the different elements that make up that throughout the supply chain, knowing what that does, how critical it is, how transferable it is, how, how sticky it is. So, you know, is it easy to move that service to another provider and how long would it take and how much investment from you to, yeah. to move it across um, is really important. And so knowing then, are there weak links within that supply chain? And then knowing, yeah, then it comes back to you, you need all that data. Uh, and then you can take uh, it might be um you don't want to screen out suppliers that could be really effective but maybe you're a bit more cautious with the the elements of the service that are really really critical and hard to move to somebody else so you sort of you take an intelligent approach about which bits of your supply chain you're willing to take a bigger risk on yeah and so, so that that's the sort of the data that i'm really interested in yeah thanks chris Barry, you can feel free to answer on data and I'm going to give you the first go at answering Robert's question in a moment. So did you want to say anything on data first? Yeah, I mean, I put a bit there in the chat um, in answer to the question. I mean, I think there's a real challenge on us in terms of being comfortable in using data um, and sort of really sort of becoming um, sort of economists in our own right in terms of comparing and contrasting data to give us insights. 
Um, but I think the real challenge at the moment, um, certainly when you look across government, you know, we, we don't have a standard operating model or platform. We've got lots of different systems, departments are operating quite independently. So the emergence of these sort of data integration layers and harnessing the data and bringing that together is pretty key. And I think one of the benefits and successes that we've seen under Gareth Reese williams with the government commercial function is this push to try and aggregate data and to build insights. Um, and that in itself has been pretty helpful, actually, to Chris's point on looking at some of the suppliers that have gone into administration or insolvency and liquidation. Uh, we have been able to respond to that and understand the impact of that quite quickly through availability of data. Yeah, thanks, Baron. OK, so Robert's question, um, which I think is the why are we even worried about this kind of question, is what are the social and environmental risks of not properly managing supply chains? I mean, I think that is kind of a well, how bad can it get kind of answer, but Barry, you first. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of quite passionate about this because I think we have a, a moral obligation and responsibility to do it. But even when I look it through my lens uh, and I look it through my daughter's lenses in terms of the priority and focus that they put on it, it, it is far more ingrained in them as a uh, generation in terms of what we deliver. And, you know, for anyone who's a custodian of a FTSE 100 company or a Fortune 500 company, uh, it takes years to build some of these companies. And yet we're mm. starting to see some of them in the share prices in particular can be quite heavily damaged as a result of environmental or social um, issues. So it's no longer just an issue of something you need to consider because it's, you know, something you need to do within the supply chain. Of no just give Barry two seconds again. I can see Matthew, thank you. You're typing some answers to questions directed straight at you. Uh, Barry, yeah. I'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to answer one. <laughs> no problem. Barry, you were just finishing off there. Yeah, and um, you know, the, the impact on shareholders uh, means that this is getting more prominent. So I think there is a much bigger and greater push but equally that just adds to the concentration risk that I discussed earlier in terms of what we as commercial professionals need to consider within the supply chain. Yeah, thanks Barry. I've just looked at the clock and this is gonna be the final round of questions. So I'm gonna ask everybody to answer this question as well. And I'll come to you last, Tomasa, but anything else that you want to bring in as well at this point, you can. So Chris, your thoughts on what are the risks of not doing this well? Well, if you don't manage your supply chains, the risk is public services fail. And then there's a huge impact on environmental and, and social um, issues. Um, yeah. You know, if, you, if you've got a waste collector, for example, just, just make up an example, and their, their services fail, um, you know, you've got an immediate environmental impact. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if, if it's a supplier that um, supports a hospital or something you know even even sort of the rail network or something like that it's got massive impact on people's lives um yeah. so so it, it matters that's why that's why we do what we do thanks chris and i guess as we said that concentration of issues is is kind of unprecedented so it's even more important that we don't let these things fail going forward because we you know everything's so much tighter public spending and everything's so much tighter ben your thoughts on this big question well, prob probably um, two thoughts. The first is um, uh, wider than what Chris said, uh, government procurement is a, is a significant part of demand in the economy. And I, I also think uh, it worries me no end. Uh, much as I support central procurement, and I think that's brought about some pretty significant improvements. Um, I think there's been some really bad, you know, really you know, inefficient practice that that's helped deal with central procurement. It really does worry me the uh, the possibility for central procurement to um, to be a drag on innovation. If this if the government's demand doesn't go into innovative businesses and goes to the usual suspects because they're safe and they deliver and we understand their supply chains, uh, we risk innovation and ultimately uh, risk the, uh, the the economy. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think we have to tread. Uh, I think we have to tread very warily. But the, but this area of work and doing it thoughtfully is very important. Thanks, Ben. I also want very quickly. You mentioned Brexit as kind of a particular UK issue at the moment. Do you see that getting easier over time? So obviously, Thomas Tomaso talked about the big global issues. But you know, how long do you think it's going to take before some of those Brexit-related issues 
ease off a little bit? I, I mentioned Brexit as a catch-all. Well, actually, that would be a better question for, for, for probably um, Barry or Chris. My, my gut feel is that, is that on, the, on the government purchasing side, uh, Brexit is a problem that's kind of largely mitigated, but they would know far more about it than me. Okay. Uh, just, just to chip in on, I mean, we've got this session, I just put the link in. Um, we're very much picking up on what the challenges are for domestic regulators post Brexit. Um, but I think we'll all also end up talking about supply chain issues because of some of those themes around environmental challenge. Brilliant. Thank you. And we will, we will email those links as well that you're sharing as well, Matthew, to everybody. There. Matthew, did you want to, before I come to Tommaso for some closing thoughts, did you want to pick up on this? You know, what, what are the risks if we don't get this right? Yeah, I mean, I think that the sort of thrux of what I was talking about was that, you know, when, when we look at public service and taxpayer exposure, these common themes about whether it's supply chain financial or supply chain environmental factors, they transcend the, the outsourcing and the procurement. They're right across into those areas that we all depend on. So, you know, the, the resilience of public services, mm. no matter how they're delivered, is, is, is a major concern now. Mm. Um, and so, you know, that, that can be affect people in different ways, obviously, depending on their income and their wealth. Um, but but it, you know, the, all the things we're talking about, I think, are going to be, you know, continue to be a real pressure point and focus area for government. And as you've all said, you know, if we're going to hit the net zero targets on that slightly parallel issue, then it's really important that we understand the environmental impacts of the uh, supply chain as well. Tommaso, uh, we started with you. I'm going to finish with you, your reflections on what you've heard. All right. Um, so first of all, I would, I would, I would start probably with uh, something on uh, Brexit. I'm going to put a link on uh, on the chat. We, uh, we do have a paper on Brexit and, it's, and specifically on how uh, UK firms have been um, adjusting uh, supply chains after the TCA uh, entered into force. And I'll just give the headline there. The result is essentially that firms seem to be doing a mix between reshoring, which is uh, like, uh, you know, relying more on, 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 on British suppliers than in the past, uh, and, um, you know, um, and, and supply diversification, both domestically and, and internationally, which sounds about right, right? I mean, like, you know, a, a, mix, a, a mix of things. So I'll put the link later to, to this one. Um, I'll conclude with, so first of all, this was an amazing discussion, okay, uh, in which uh, I have seen, like, you know, the practical difficulties, I guess, of applying some of the things that I see more from uh, far away, but uh, that's why it has been um, amazing. So I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll concentrate on two uh, words. Um, one is pivot, which I believe was used by Barry at some point, right? You know, the, the, the question is, like, you see that something is coming, or you think yeah. that coming something is coming, and obviously you would like to pivot or to switch at the right moment. Um, there is no magic formula, I'm afraid, uh, for for that. What I can say though is that um, you know the way the profession is, and here I mean not my profession directly, but rather the data analytics profession profession has come to process this data and the predictive power that this data can have. Uh, has improved, okay? So like, uh, has improved a lot over time. It's not gospel, you should not take it as gospel, absolutely not, but but it, it, it can help. And it can help, you know, of course the decision finally is yours, it's up to the business, it's up to the government to move a bit ahead of the curve, but at least you have the good uh, data um, for doing this. So once we, one was pivot, the other one is concentration of risks. I co completely agree with that. Um, there is our um, chief um, data scientist, Anthony Scrifignano in the US. He talks about uh, hyper, disruptive, hyper disruptions in a hyper disrupted world. Um, and uh, I completely agree with him in, in the sense that, you know, this is like, the supply chain world to me, and I'm taking this from Anthony, so I'm not going to take uh, uh, credit for that, uh, but it's like a closed system in which, you know, uh, there is a shock and waves sort of propagate, mm -hmm. okay, in all directions, and they can come back, okay? So, and I think 
paradoxically, this is exactly the environment where data can help, okay? In closed systems, like, you know, uh, commercial data sets, like the ones we have in our cloud, for example, uh, can be extremely, uh, extremely helpful. And, you know, we are making also an effort to to make our solutions more user-friendly, user okay? Um, overall, um, I would say there's a lot of challenges um, uh, ahead of us, and there's a lot of challenges that are also specific um, uh, to the UK. I can't, you know, uh, help to conclude uh, about saying that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, data is a source of information. It's better to, you know, of course you need to have good data, but that's why you have professionals uh, out there. You might not have the time to clean the data yourself, but there are people for doing you know, who can do that for you. Um, so I'll stop here. But uh, you know, I yeah. Thanks so much, Tommaso. I can't believe this conversation has gone so quickly. I completely agree with what James said. Thank you to all the speakers. You've been fantastic. Such a good, high-quality uh, panel. And thanks to all the audience who sent in their questions as well. Just to say to the audience, you should have had a um, questionnaire sent to you. Please do take a couple of minutes to fill that in. It just means we can give you exactly the type of webinars that are useful for you. Uh, on your screens, you should see we have another webinar tomorrow already. We, we have them every week. There's another one tomorrow, Future of the Office in the Public Sector, all about hybrid working and everything. But on our website, all the information about our webinars will be there. We will be sending you a link to this video, a recording of this discussion, so you can watch it all again or share it with your colleagues if you think it will be helpful for them. And there will be an article written in a couple of weeks as well with the key points from today's uh, conversation, which we will be sharing with you as well. For me, I think the key messages were trust and relationships, the importance of due diligence, but also looking more broadly, not relying on just traditional types of information, but also using those kind of insights from uh, data. And there is lots of guidance available to you. So please do access the uh, guidance that is there. But that just leaves me to say a final thank you to everybody. Thank you to Dan and Bradstreet for being our knowledge partner today. And I hope we see you all again very soon. Thank you to Matthew, to Tommaso, to Chris, to Barry and to Ben. Um, and hope to see you again very soon on another one of our webinars. Thanks, everybody. And goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thanks.